Hello, welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is the integumentary system. So you may be used to a bone and muscle of the day at this point in the semester, but uh, I'm not gonna do it today. I'm having a very human day, and I'm really tired, and I don't know how much you guys like these things anyway. And in a face-to-face -face class, we always have one day without it. And then the next day, I, I ask on the warm-up of the day for feedback, what did you think of not having a bone of the day and a muscle of the day? And in the face-to-face -face class, the students are usually disappointed. So at this point in the semester, we're almost halfway through. And um, usually, people really start liking them. So I hope you are, too. Maybe I'll ask you for feedback. You can tell me in your uh, discussion post for the week. But I digress. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, everything that we need to for the integument. So the integumentary system is probably the most simple system. A lot of instructors will start here as the first uh, system in their classes because it makes a lot of sense right after tissues. I think that if we start talking about the sensory receptors that we find here in the skin, and I just tell you about them now, like you'd memorize it for the test and then you'd forget about it and it wouldn't matter. But if I made you memorize it already for the nervous system and now we talk about it in the system in which it resides, it's gonna make a lot more sense. So, sense have some sensation. So yeah, <laughs> that's one of the functions of the skin is to help provide sense and we'll get there in a moment. But um, the integumentary system is an organ system. So the skin is just the biggest organ of the integumentary system. The other organs of the integumentary system are your hairs and your nails. What? Yeah, integumentary system consists of skin, hair, and nails. And now the skin is our largest organ, obviously. It's gonna have sensory receptors in it. It's gonna have glands in it. So it's a pretty darn complex organ and we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. The most time in this chapter, talking about the anatomy and physiology of the skin. We'll just briefly cover pretty much the functions of hair and nails. We're gonna talk a lot about the anatomy of a hair follicle because it has, that brings a lot of stuff together in the skin. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, another interesting thing about the skin is that this is an organ that never stops growing. So it grows from kind of like the stratum basale or the bottom up. Not really the bottom up, the dermis is below that, but it's kind of cool. So it forever grows upward and outward and dies off and you slough off these dead skin cells. So that's pretty interesting, I think. Um, all right, so let's just jump right in. First, let's have a quick question because I really, Teach the class the way that I do because it's really going to help you just keep building and building and building on what you know. So we just got done talking about tissues. Why do they apply? Well, they form organs. So the organ, skin, contains A, epithelial tissue, B, areolar connective tissue, C, dense irregular connective tissue, D, all of the above. So yeah, the answer is all of the above. So if you were just like, what, what? How was I supposed to know that? Well, the answer is you were just tested on this. And we talked about uh, our different types of tissues. Our four main categories are epithelial tissues, connective tissues, then we've got nervous tissues and muscle tissues. We already talked about epithelial tissues and connective tissue and nervous tissue in great de detail. So epithelial tissue, the epidermis contains keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, the papillary layer of your dermis contains areolar connective tissue, and the reticular layers of, of your dermis contains dense irregular connective tissue. All right, the structure of your skin. So so in your book, you can look at a figure that is showing you this, and this is what it's talking about. The structure of the skin has two main kind of divisions, the epidermis up here, and then the dermis down here. And structures that we can find in here, if we look up at the epidermis, going all the way from down here in the hypodermis, up through the dermis and onto the surface of the epidermis is a 
gland. So glands are epithelial derived structures that reside in the dermis and exocrine glands are going to dump their product into a duct that releases onto the epithelial surface. Here we have a hair follicle, so your skin, um, not all skin contains hair. And this is actually funny because thick skin, which this is showing, does not contain hair. They should put the hair somewhere else. I digress. We'll get there in a minute. Structures that we can see here. These are sebaceous glands. We've got sensory receptors. We've got blood vessels. We've got little muscles that help to stand your hair on end. So the dermis really contains a lot of this stuff. And it's bringing in these larger, well, this is the hypodermis down here, the subcutaneous layer. It's going to bring in our blood vessels and things that are going to branch. And then we're going to branch into these small little capillaries that go into uh, this most superficial aspect of the dermis to serve the epidermis. And why is that? I hope you could see my fingers and all that I was just talking about. Hey. And the reason that we need all of those structures to come up here in the dermis is because epithelial tissue is avascular, right? We said that epithelial tissue is avascular but highly innervated. Well, it doesn't have its own blood supply. It's getting its blood supply from the underlying dermis. So that's the overall structure of the skin. We're going to get in some nitty gritty detail about all this stuff right now. Okay. So, the epidermis. It's interesting, I don't quite know why the book does it this way, but we go through the cells of the epidermis, and then we're gonna talk about the layers of the epidermis from deep to superficial, and then we're gonna talk about the layers of the dermis from superficial to deep. So, first, I actually, before we step away and get into the nitty gritty of the skin, I want to address this right now. This is a layer of adipose connective tissue called the subcutaneous layer, or the hypodermis. Hypo means below. Dermis is the dermis. Your hypodermis is also called your subcutaneous layer. Sub means below. Cutaneous, your cutaneous membrane is your skin. The hypodermis is not part of your skin. It's just not part of your skin. It's underneath your skin. But we talk about the hypodermis right now, and you'll see it's in your book right now, because there's really nowhere else to talk about it. This is the place that it makes sense to talk about it, is with the integumentary system. But if the organs of the integumentary system are the skin, the hair, and the nails, is something below the skin part of the integumentary system? No, it's a tissue without a home. So we stick it here. All right, so this is the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. The structure of the skin, if we're getting like nitty gritty, the structure of the skin is that it contains the epidermis. We're about to go into great detail uh, discussing. And the dermis, which we'll talk a little bit about, it's not as interesting as the epidermis. It doesn't have as many cell types and stuff, but that's the skin. So that's the structure of the skin. All right, so sitting below the skin, below the skin, below, ah, right underneath it, or subcutaneous, or hypodermis. This is the subcutaneous layer, <laughs> okay? And what it is is adipose, loose connective tissue, this is where we have our biggest fuel store. This is where when you're gaining and losing weight, you are gaining and losing it from. The adipocytes there are not dividing after about two years old. Adipose tissue is amitotic. So what's happening when you're gaining and losing weight is that each of these little adipocytes is getting bigger and then getting smaller and getting bigger and getting smaller. You know, it's the holidays, they get bigger. You have your turkey and your pie and then you burn it off in the summer and they get smaller. So the subcutaneous layer is really important for that. It's really, it's got an important function in insulation. It helps with protection. Um, it helps with that fuel reserve. So if we're thinking of the subcutaneous layer, it is below the skin. Its structure is that it's adipose connective tissue. There's some areolar connective tissue scattered throughout, and we've got fibroblasts that are secreting this uh, ground substance and matrix similar to that. But the highest number of cells are these adipocytes. And the function then is this is really going to give us our reserve fuel. 
and our insulation. Like those big functions of adipose tissue are served by the subcutaneous layer. Now why did I go over like that in such big detail and make such a big stink about saying that it's not part of the skin? Well, because if I were to ask you something like, list the layers of the skin and a function of each, and you were to give me the hypodermis, you would be wrong. That's not a layer of the skin. Or if I were to say something like, True or false, the subcutaneous layer is an important part of the skin. The answer would be false, that's not part of the skin. Now if I were to say, true or false, the subcutaneous layer is important to homeostasis in the body, that is absolutely true, but it's not part of the skin, all right? Okay, so now let's talk about the skin. So we're going to start by looking at the cells that we find in the epidermis. I said we were going to talk more about the epidermis than the dermis. It's because there's a bunch of cells there, and it's kind of more interesting. It's got more layers. So let's look at it. So we said that your skin was a, not a, a keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And it's keratinized because it's got these O cells, O sites, that accumulate a bunch of keratin. Keratin is a waterproofing protein. Now we're not waterproof, but we are water resistant. And it's because these keratinocytes are accumulating a bunch of keratin on their journey through the epidermis from deep to superficial. So keratin is a waterproofing protein. And our keratinocytes are going to be the cells that accumulate a large amount of this to give us this water kind of resistance so that we don't lose too much water and so that we don't absorb too much water. And this actually helps to act like prevent the absorption of toxins and things to some degree. So keratin is a waterproofing protein. Keratinocytes accumulate keratin. They are the most abundant cells in the epidermis. Anytime we see something that's the most abundant, it's the most important. So that's their big important job is to help give us this kind of waterproof or water resistant barrier. Uh, and the other thing about these cells is that they're like, they, it's kind of a function to die. Their function is to accumulate a lot of protein and then die off as they reach the superficial surfaces so that we can readily slough those cells off. I actually have an itch right now. It's illustrating a good point, which is that if you're scratching your epidermis, you don't want those cells you're scratching off to be alive. So our keratinocytes, we could say that these are going to die off as they move superficially. And this is going to give us abrasion resistance. Okay. All right, then, and so where do we find these? We find these there dividing from the stem cells and they're moving all the way through and we find the dead ones on the top. Okay, melanocytes, these are O cells that are accumulating or their job is to produce the pigment protein melanin. So it ranges depending on um, your cell type, your DNA in your melanocytes. It can range, I think they say from like orange to brown to black. So maybe it's not orange, maybe it's like rust color. So melanin actually has a pretty wide range of hues it seems, but it's definitely the dark pigment. It's what like melanin accumulations give you freckles and moles. So for melanin or for our melanocytes, we could say that these produce the pigment melanin. And we'll talk more about melanin in a little bit when we get to skin tone. Their job then is to produce this melanin and what they're doing is sticking it in the keratinocytes as they're going by. So these cells are accumulating keratin as they go up and these cells are reaching in and dropping in some melanin so that you get your characteristic skin tone. Uh, this the kind of the job of melanin here, I'm going to show you where we find these different cells. So keratinocytes we find all throughout. They start dying off in this 
kind of region right here. So they're all dead from here on up. So down in here, they're not all dead yet. And down here in this lowest layer, we've got stem cells dividing to give rise to the new keratinocytes that are moving up. There are melanocytes in there as well, and they're gonna stick out these little feet and add melanin to all these cells that are going up and coming through. And they, their, their activity will increase with sun exposure. I hope this erases. Okay, it does. So let's imagine that the sun, oh, it's not great. <laughs> let's imagine that the sun is hitting your skin. Then what it's going to do is activate these melanocytes and their activity will increase and they'll add more and more and more melanin to these keratinocytes going by. So you'll get red and you'll get a sunburn. And what's happening then is you're darkening this here so that by the time they get up here, it's not so red anymore. It's like, um, brown, nice tan color. Uh, but what's happening here as you're accumulating all of that extra melanin is you're protecting these actively mitotic cells in the basal layer from the UV radiation that's hitting them in theory. So that's pretty cool. The melanocytes produce the pigment melanin. Something that we could say about them is they increase their activity in response to UV exposure. Okay, so if abrasion resistance is a function of dead keratinocytes, another function could be that they also help to accumulate this mel melanin. The melanocytes function is to produce it and act, this melanin acts as a natural sunscreen. So these cells are really helping to give UV resistance. Um, so these will say offer UV protection or resistance to mitotic cells are stem cells that are dividing to give rise to the keratinocytes. Okay, because remember we said epithelial tissues are actively mitotic, right? They're always regenerating. They're exposed to some kind of something. They're lining or um, forming a barrier or a boundary. So this we're exposed to the whole external environment. So we need to readily divide down here so that we can push up cells up, oh, no, readily divide down here, sorry. So that we can readily push up cells uh, to die off, be sloughed off. Okay, cool, what next? The other types of cells, oh, so where do we find melanocytes, sorry. I just want to like get all this stuff in like our pocket. So keratinocytes we find throughout. Melanocytes, their bodies are in the lowest layer called the stratum basale. But as they get more active, the stratum basale is this deepest layer right here. This is where we've got our actively mitotic cells that are pushing up new cells. Melanocyte bodies are down here as well. And they're reaching their little feet up though into the more superficial layer, uh, layers of the next one called the stratum spinosum. So we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, dendritic cells, do they? Dendritic cells are these cells that provide the only local immunity for the epidermis. So the epidermis does not have blood vessels. So white blood cells aren't getting in there on a regular basis. They don't just live there because there's no blood supply there. So the only resident cells that we have are these cells called dendritic cells. And these will say are resident phagocytes. So they offer the only local immunity in the epidermis. And these are found in the next layer up, the stratum spinosum. And then our last cells, we actually already talked about when we talked about modified free nerve endings. And we said our free nerve endings 
can reach up and form these tactile complexes where the free nerve ending will reach up and contact cells in the, uh, these tactile cells in the epidermis. So that's these cells here. So these hook up to free nerve endings to sense uh, like very light pressure. So um, we'll just say these are sensory receptive cells. And this brings it all together with the stuff that you learned from chapter 13. Awesome. Okay, so tactile cells, where do you find them? Stratum basali, the basal layer. So let's talk about all those layers. What are they? So now we're gonna look and we're gonna move from deep to superficial. Why? Because as we move through the layers from deep to superficial, the cells are gonna die off so that they can be readily sloughed off and that's uh, the, your uppermost layer, the stratum corneum. Okay, so the deepest layer, the basal layer, is the stratum basali. This is in contact with the papillary layer of the dermis. So I'll just say with the dermis. It's one layer. And what do we have in it? Actively mitotic cells. This is why we need protection from UV radiation. We have cells that are always dividing down here so that we can have cells that are always dying and sloughing off up here, which means that we're always exposing our DNA potentially to UV radiation. If you're mitotic, you've got to do DNA replication. And if you've got UV radiation while that's happening, then you have more chances for error and thus skin cancer. So our, in our stratum basali, in this layer, we We've got actively mitotic cells that are giving rise to our keratinocytes. This is where we find the bodies of our melanocytes. And this is where we find our tactile cells. Okay, our next layer, the stratum spinosum or the spiny layer is several layers thick. What does that mean? Well, it changes in different parts of skin. We all know that there are some parts that are thinner and some parts that are thicker, so that's gonna have a lot of variability. So the stratum basali was down here. This teeny tiny one layer right here. And then next, so is our stratum spinosum in here. And here's our stratum granulosum stratum lucidum, stratum corneum. Okay, so that's where we're going. Stratum spinosum is the spiny layer. Why do they call it the spiny layer? Well, when you fix tissue histologically and it like dries and then you stain it, the cells in this layer, it kind of looks like spiky. And it's because the cells in this layer are joining up with desmosomes in their plasma membranes. What do desmosomes do? They physically snap cell membranes together, right? Those were the cell junctions that are gonna be like snaps on your raincoat. So they help your cells act as a cohesive fabric, but it doesn't um, prevent the absolute passage of materials between them. So what we could say is happening in the stratum spinosum, this is several layers of cells that are uh, where our keratinocytes are linking up by desmosomes. Several layers of keratinocytes linking up with desmosomes. What else? Well, this is where our melanocytes can reach their feet into to add more melanin if necessary. So we could say melanocyte feet we could find here. And they're adding melanin to those keratinocytes. I'm not gonna write it down again because I already did. You can push pause and rewind if you need to. What other cell types do we find here? This is where our dendritic cells are. And so all of our cells are still living. We still don't have blood supply, so what's happening is we're having like nutrient and gas exchange occurring down its concentration gradient through these cells to the connective tissue. We'll talk more about that later. 
Okay, dendritic cells. So those are all the cells we find in the stratum spinosum. The next layer is the stratum granulosum, or the grainy layer. And it looks this way because this is where we are accumulating a lot of keratin and the cells kind of start looking grainy. So this is called the grainy layer. And this is anywhere from one to five cell layers thick. And what's happening here is this is where we're really accumulating a lot of keratin. So by the time you get to the most superficial layers of the stratum granulosum, your cells are dead. In the deeper layers, your cells are still living. So I would imagine probably maybe in like your thick skin where we have a different layer altogether, we would have uh, maybe only one layer of your stratum granulosum. In thin skin, um, you might have, you know, find five layers. So in the deeper layers, our cells are still living. They're still close enough to that blood supply that nutrient and gas exchange is significant and they haven't accumulated so much keratin that they just die. So what we could say, the function of this layer is that that our keratinocytes are accumulating large amounts of keratin and dying off by the superficial layers. So keratinocytes accumulate high amounts of keratin and die off as they move superficially. Alright, our next layer is called the stratum lucidum or the clear layer and it looks clear because the cells as they're moving superficially are not only accumulating keratin, they're accumulating another protein called elidin. Elidin doesn't pick up dye, so when you look at thick skin histologically, this layer looks clear. And it's just a couple cell layers thick, but what this does is confer we find it in thi uh, hairless skin, so like, mm, and then also like like on this uh, in high concentration. Um, uh, I'm not gonna edit this brain fart, but that's what that was. So <laughs> in the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And what you'll notice is that that skin is hairless. That skin is also super UV resistant. So what's interesting about this the thick skin is that these cells are also accumulating a lead-in, so our keratinocytes also accumulate a lead -in. and this gives extra UV protection. So I've had some students say, well, why wouldn't you just put that everywhere? Well, because apparently you can't grow hair there, and we need hair for sensory perception. So, um, yeah, and this, so UV resistance is sure important. Um, the story that I like to tell to like kind of set this in people's minds, we'll call it brain break, is that when my daughter turned eight years old, we did not yet have an American Girl doll store here in Colorado, so I decided to save up my money and take her on a fancy trip to LA to go to the American Girl doll store there. And her birthday is July 3rd, so July 4th is the holiday, you get to hang out on the beach all day and watch fireworks at night, right? So that's what I thought. We went out and probably got to the beach around 10 a.m. and I was slathering her all up with sunscreen and you know every a half an hour 45 minutes she comes back slather her up again we stayed on the beach probably well from like 10 a.m. until the fireworks were done at like 9 or 10 p.m. and I did not put sunscreen on myself until 4 p.m. and oh my gosh let me tell you what that was the most disgusting worst sunburn I have ever had I that it blistered and peeled three different times. I had huge fluid filled pockets all over my skin and those popped and peeled and I got more that popped and peeled. It was awful and I wish I had taken pictures to do document it. It was quite a phenomenon that my body did but there was not a lick a problem on my palms or on my, the soles of my feet because Elidin is such a good, v, u, good UV 
radiation protector. Okay, your brain break is over. All right, ow, ooh, I just stubbed my toe on this toe, ow, ow, okay. <laughs> All right, so your most superficial layer is your stratum corneum, and that is 20 to 30 layers of dead keratinocytes. They are really now flattening out and looking all squamous, which is what makes this a stratified squamous epithelial tissue, and its big job is to be readily sloughed off. So, stratum corneum. Whoa, 20 to 30 layers of dead keratinocytes. All right, that's your epidermis. All right, the layer of the dermis that is in contact with the epidermis is the papillary layer. Why is it called the papillary layer? Well, if you noticed, it looked like this. Uh, what you're gonna see is we've got papilla all over the place. You got papilla on your tongue, they look like that. You got papilla in your kidney, they look like that. If you got something that looks like that, chances are it's a papilla. So the papillary layer is kind of this ridged layer that is poking up into the epidermis. And this is areolar connective tissue, which we said was the best example of connective tissue proper. It does the job of connecting one tissue type to another tissue type. So connecting our reticular layer of our dermis, which is dense irregular connective tissue, to our stratified squamous epithelial tissue of the epidermis. So this is the papillary layer, and its really big important function is to, we'll say, it brings in the capillaries that serve the epidermis. And it really anchors the epidermis to the dermis. And what do I mean by that? Well, it like sticks up in there and holds the reticular layer to the epidermis. And that's important. Um, and it causes these things called friction ridges. So you could look at your hands and see your most prominent, probably recognizable friction ridges, your fingerprints. But you could look anywhere on your skin and see that there are prints. Can you see them? You can see a lot of hair, accessory structure. Uh, <laughs> so, no, another organ of the skin. So, the other function, we could say, is this is going to anchor the epidermis to the dermis. And this creates friction ridges. So I'm always a fact versus function kind of lady. This is a fact. This is the function. So the function of the papillary layer is to anchor these two tissue types together. It's gonna anchor our epidermis to our dermis. A fact of this arrangement is that it creates friction ridges. Why do I say that? Because I might say something like, true or false, an important function of the papillary layer is to create friction ridges. And I would say, no, that's a fact. An important function is to anchor the epidermis to the dermis, okay? All right. So the bulk of our skin is actually the reticular layer of the dermis. So if you look here, this is what's giving a lot of structure to the skin. And this is dense, irregular connective tissue. What's the function? Resist stretch in many directions, right? And this is where the larger branches of our blood vessels are gonna come into the skin. And this is also where we will find a majority of our cutaneous uh, receptors. Although um, our tactile complexes are sticking up into the papillary layer. But you can see here, 
here's the papillary layer here with those blood vessels I was telling you about. And then here is the reticular layer here. So a couple things I want to point out about the reticular layer here. It's got this, de this dense irregular connective tissue that's going to help to support, give support and structure to the skin, resist stretch in many directions. This is where we find a bulk of our sensory receptors. And this is also where we find what are called epithelial derived structures that reside in the dermis. They're poking through the dermis and often into the hypo, uh, hypodermis. So just be aware of that because we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. I hope I was, again, forgive me if you weren't seeing my fingers lining up with this model. I'm looking at it, not the camera. You need a camera man. Okay, so yeah, epithelial derived structures that re reside in the dermis, hair follicle, uh, um, our exocrine glands of the skin. So just be aware of that. So why did I tell you that for this? Because that's where we'll find most of our cutaneous receptors. And this is also where like our glands are often poking down into uh, all the way down into the reticular layer of the dermis. So the function we'll say, is to contain, it, well, the fact is that it contains the blood vessels and nerves that serve the integument, and the function then is to supply um, with nutrient to gas exchange and give cutaneous sensations, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll say this contains the blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves that serve the skin. All right, that's the anatomy. Let's talk a little bit more about physiology when we get to functions. Okay, quick question for you. These cells protect my tonic cells from UV radiation. A, keratinocytes, B, melanocytes, C, dendritic cells, D, all of the above. All right, yeah, it's melanocytes, and they're protecting mitotic cells from UV radiation by adding the dark pigment melanin, which helps to protect from UV radiation. Skin color. Okay, everybody has characteristic shade of their skin tone, and it's determined primarily by your melanocytes and the type of melanin that they make. So there are three pigments that affect your skin tone and melanin is the dark pigment that has the greatest effect. And it ranges from like a dark, like rusty orange all the way to black. So this is the dark pigment that has the largest impact on skin tone. You can also find aggregates of melanocytes in freckles and moles where they're making those areas darker as well. Another color that can have an effect on skin tone is something that we actually find in foods called carotene. And this is the orange pigment that you find in orange fruits and vegetables. And it can accumulate in your skin, particularly in your stratum lucidum. So if you eat a lot of orange things, you might notice that your palms and soles of your feet are orange. So carotene, this is the orange pigment found in foods. I'll say in plant foods. Uh, and this accumulates particularly in the stratum lucidum. I mean, but you could see it throughout the layers if uh, of any layer of, well, you could see it throughout any, if you eat enough of it, you can see it everywhere is what I'm trying to say. So here's another brain break. I have this friend rhymes with smelly, smelly. No, she's not my friend anymore. She was my friend and her father, we could call him Dick. It's an appropriate substitute for his name. Uh, <laughs> I called smelly one day and I was like, Hey, I want to do an experiment. I want to see how long it takes me to turn orange if I just start eating only orange pigmented plant foods. And she was like, no, you don't have to do that experiment. Dick already did it. He went down to Costco and got 40 pounds of carrots on sale. 
So now he's like making carrot noodles and carrot juice and he's giving all his friends and relations carrots and everybody's got carrots. And after about a week, his family started looking at him, Dad, you maybe should back off on the carrots. No, 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 it's fine, I'm great. He keeps juicing it, he's having carrot sauce, carrot meatloaf, that's not even possible. Carrots everywhere. By week three, he was so orange that his family had to have an intervention. They stepped in and they took pictures and they showed him, him now <laughs> and him before the Costco carrots and he was, yeah, actually orange. So this can be significant if you eat a lot of carrots. All right, the last pigment that can have an effect on skin color is hemoglobin. And this is the red um, we see in our red blood cells. Hemoglobin looks red. And so this is the red that we see in our red blood cells. And so its effect is totally masked by melanin. So it's hard to see the effect of hemoglobin if you've got really active melanocytes. Uh, but let, um, let's say, like think about redheads. They have pretty fair skin and they have low levels of melanin so they sunburn really easily and um, also they kind of look pink. And the reason that they kind of look pink is because you can see the effect of the red of their red blood cells because it isn't being masked by as much melanin as those of us who have um, kind of darker uh, producing or high, more active probably melanocytes. So hemoglobin is the red in red blood cells. We could say that the, the effect on skin color is masked by melanin. All right, I have a quick question for you. If your teacher farts during class and his cheeks turn red, this is due to the effect of blank on skin color. Yeah, hemoglobin, right? As his cheeks flush with blood, then you'll see the effect of red on skin color. All right, functions of the skin. Okay, now that you know the anatomy, what about the physiology? So the first and most obvious function of the skin is that it forms a physical barrier. So there are actually three barriers that the skin forms, a physical barrier, a chemical barrier, and a biological barrier. So physical barrier is most obvious. So by being this like tough keratinized surface tissue, you're really preventing just the passive entrance of things into your internal environment. So we could think that um, like our tough uh, keratinocytes prevent physical entry of stuff. Now that's not an absolutely all-inclusive thing. I went camping this weekend and a tree like entered through, it physically penetrated through my skin. But I mean, it has to be like, you know, to get through there, you gotta be tough. There's just not passive passage of material into your body because we've got this tough uh, physical barrier provided by that nice linking together of our keratinocytes with those desmosomes. Um, there's also a chemical barrier. What is this? Well, the exocrine glands of your skin secrete sweat that's rich in waste and like urea, um, lactic acid, and that actually helps to create what's called an acid mantle or a low pH of the skin that's antimicrobial. So chemical barrier, we could say the acid mantle of the skin is created by sweat, uh, is the low pH of skin created by sweat, or we could say due to sweat, and this is antimicrobial. So it prevents the replication of a whole bunch of microbes, which is awesome because, I mean, there are bacteria everywhere in the entire world, all over your skin. Your skin is no exception, but a lot of the dangerous ones 
can't really do a whole lot because the um, acidic uh, kind of acid mantle of your skin. And then we also have a biological barrier. Biological living, biology is the study of life, a biological barrier is a living barrier and this is due to the dendritic cells in your epidermis but then also macrophages that can come into your dermis. So your dermis has a uh, blood supply and so white blood cells can get in there and macrophages have the job of wandering in and out of tissues and seeing what's there, what they need to eat up. So the biological barrier we could say is due to our dendritic cells in the epidermis and due to macrophages in the dermis <clears throat> or white blood cells but primarily I'll put that in parentheses uh, primarily macrophages are going to be wandering in there okay the next important function of the skin is that it's actually going to help with body temperature regulation. And we talked about this like week one when we talked about negative feedback and how negative feedback is in helping to maintain your body temperature. Well, where were the effectors? When you were hot, we sure dilated those blood vessels and brought that hot blood to the surface of your skin where we could turn on sweat glands, right? And lose heat through evaporative cooling. So that's going to be one way. Well, then if we're too cold, we can constrict those blood vessels, which actually helps with another function, blood reservoir as well. Bring all of that blood from the surface into the body. So um, we could say that our blood vessels in the integument uh, we'll, we'll say can move hot blood to and from the surface of the skin and the other thing is that we've got sweat glands that can turn on to assist with evaporative cooling. Okay, another important function is that our skin is going to provide us with cutaneous sensations. Your skin is your cutaneous membrane and it contains sensory receptors for the general senses like light pressure or your hair follicle receptors if a bug lands on your arm or if like a breeze blows your hair or something like that. Uh, pain temperature so we could say that your skin contains uh, cutaneous receptors for the general senses what are the general senses pain pressure touch vibration heat everything that's not special Okay, metabolic functions. What? First of all, does anybody know what metabolism is? It's the sum total of chemical events going on in your body. So we have events that build stuff up. We call that ana anabolism or anabolic stuff. And then we have events that break stuff down. That's catabolic or um, catabolism. So anabolism and catabolism all together make up metabolism. And the skin actually produces a bunch of weird enzymes and stuff that we're not going to go into. There's one thing we are going to go into, vitamin D3 synthesis. And that's because in your skin, the precursor for active vitamin D3 synthesis exists. And with UV exposure, it gets activated. And that's going to go to your liver and become something. And that's going to go to the kidneys and become something. And that's going to help with calcium absorption in your small intestine. So blood calcium homeostasis is actually in part due to what's going on in your skin. That's a hugely important metabolic function. And so for the little quick blurb of a sentence I'll write right here, we'll just say that the precursor for vitamin D is activated by UV in the skin. Um, maybe I'll say vitamin D3 is activated in the skin with UV exposure. 
well, wait a minute, lady. You just told me that UV exposure was bad. It's bad in excess to the point that we would be messing with DNA replication, but it's good. You actually need a little bit. They say about 10 to 15 minutes of exposure of your face and hands a day is enough to synthesize vitamin D. And they actually say that one of the biggest deficiencies in America right now and, and adult humans is a vitamin D, D deficiency. And vitamin D is necessary because it's part of a whole metabolic pathway that helps you to absorb calcium in your small intestine. All right, so what the bleep does the skin have to do with blood calcium? Well, our UV is going to hit the skin and activate vitamin D3. This is going to go to the liver and become this stuff called calcidiol. That means it's got two OHs. That's going to go to the kidneys and become calcitriol. And calcitriol is going to act synergistically with parathyroid hormone at the small intestine to increase calcium absorption. There's actually other stuff that's going on. When we get to the skeletal system, we'll talk about that as an effector for this pathway as well. For right now, we'll say that calcitriol and parathyroid hormone are both going to target the small intestine, and there they will allow for an increase in calcium absorption. Calcium is a big cation. It's got two positive charges on it. It's hard to absorb calcium. So with these two, calcitriol and parathyroid hormone, present in the system will increase calcium transporters and anything that's passing through your small intestine then we will be able to absorb. All right, so two more functions of your skin. And we also kind of talked about this a little bit. It acts as a blood reservoir because what do reservoirs do? They store stuff, right? Well, we've got all these blood vessels that are serving the skin, and if we need extra blood, then we could shunt that blood. We could constrict those blood vessels and shunt it away from the skin to wherever we need it. So blood reservoir, it stores, we could say that um, blood stored in vessels can be shunted around as needed, <laughs> which is pretty cool. I'll talk more about that when we get to the cardiovascular system and blood vessels. And then the last function of skin is that it's actually going to help with excretion, which is the removal of wastes. And the Ekrin sweat that you produce that helps with body temperature regulation is rich in wastes, like excess salts, or lactic acid, or urea, or uric acid. So excretion, we could say sweat helps with the removal of wastes. And then, for example, we could say urea, uric acid, lactic acid are all secreted in sweat. Here's another brain break. Another way that you could look at these little tangents is that these are physiologically relevant stories. I had a non-traditional student one semester come from the school I actually started at and came to the school that I now work at and she was like, that instructor there, her examples were so irrelevant and just ridiculous that I couldn't stand her anymore and I came to you. So this is just a relevant example of excretion and why this matters. Urea, uric acid. Well, we find those in high concentration in urine, right? And urine is yellow, right? Right? Well, yeah. So my ex and I moved in together and had, you know, our black bed set and oh, with a white mattress pad. And we lived together for, you know, however long before you finally do the sheets, hopefully only one week. And so I pull off those black sheets and that white mattress pad had a yellow spot as big as my ex-husband and a little bigger. And I was just like, oh my God, what is going on? He was peeing out of his sweat glands at night basically, and that sweat high in urea and uh, uric acid was staining my mattress pad. 
Okay, so then little man comes along and we're cuddling at night. And so now there's Mr. Big Yellow Spot over there. And here I am not making a yellow spot at night. Although do, I do sweat like you would not believe. So now I'm cuddling little man. And then, you know, after a week, maybe two, because it was postpartum, I pull off the sheets and there's a little man yellow spot on my mattress pad as well. So that's pretty significant. The removal of waste through sweat is pretty huge. All right, back to class. Hair. <laughs> We're not going to talk about the detailed structure of hair because it's just not horribly important that you worry about the, each part, like the medulla and the cortex and the whatever of hair. It's important that you know the functions of hair and the anatomy we're going to go over is the anatomy of a hair follicle because it's got a lot of structures that are serving a lot of these functions of the hair. So your hair, it does several things. It helps to provide sensation. So that's because we have um, those free nerve endings called the hair uh, root plexus, right? That was detecting hair deflection. So if a bug lands on your arm, you can feel it and you can swat it away. Or if somebody pulls your hair, you can punch them in the face, whatever you gotta do. So hair functions with sensation. So we'll say that our hair root plexes allow for detection of hair deflection or movement. So that's gonna be important. Another important function is actually it helps to some degree with temperature regulation. Now this is less important for us who now wear clothing and things when it's cold, uh, but it's really important for animals who don't. So hair, the function of temperature regulation is super important in animals that don't put on clothes and say live in like, you know, cold environments. So this can protect from heat loss. Um, hair. What else? It can actually help with nonverbal communication. And also, this is kind of a protection thing. So, what does this mean? Nonverbal communication. So, well, we've all seen cats, right? In a cat fight, <sighs> they get mad and they puff up their hair. That's nonverbal communication. It's saying to the other cat, like, look, I'm mad, and also it's like it, it making them look bigger. So that's kind of a protective thing. Um, but for us, like, this is hair. And I could be non-verbally communicating, right? So uh, hair helps with non-verbal communication. <sighs> what else does it help with? I don't know. Look it up. That's good. <laughs> that's the most important things about hair, right? Uh, it can also be used for identification. So like, you know, you can tell that it's your mom because she's got blue hair as opposed to some other mom who's got red hair as opposed to some other mom who's got purple hair or somebody who's just got brown hair. All hairs are okay here. All right, structure <laughs> of a hair follicle. This I really care about because there's a lot of different structures in one place here. So if we look, our hair follicle is this epithelial derived structure that resides in the dermis. And it's got several kind of tissue types. It's got our epithelial tissue, but we've also got our little blood vessels we're gonna bring up in here. We're gonna hijack a capillary. Each one of these is a dermal papilla, right? This is a dermal papilla. A hair follicle is gonna hijack a dermal papilla and make it a hair papilla. And so what does that mean? That it gets its own blood supply to serve this living structure here. So this is our hair papilla. Uh, and we'll say it was overtaken by the follicle, by the developing follicle. Why is it important? It contains the blood vessels that serve the follicle. Okay, then we also have a hair root plexus. That's our free nerve ending, detecting hair deflection. I'm not gonna write that down. I've written it down and said it a million times now. Hair root plexus detects hair deflection. 
The other thing that we find, and we're going to look at these in great detail in a minute, is what's called the sebaceous gland. And it's an exocrine gland, meaning that it releases its product into a duct, and that duct is going to empty onto an epithelial surface. Sebaceous glands release sebum. And that is going to be this oily substance that makes the hair soft and pliable. What hair? We don't even have a hair in this follicle, lady. Put it up there. You got it. Let's make it a blue hair, because that's why they call me Professor Blue. I don't have blue hair anymore. They told me it was making me look too old. I like blue hair, though, and I want to go back. So there's our blue hair. It wouldn't be blue down here naturally, but it'd be all blue on top if I was dying it. And OK, so now these sebaceous glands are going to add sebum onto this hair. So as it grows past, this sebum is going to make the hair soft and pliable. So this is a sebaceous gland, and they release sebum. This makes the hair soft and pliable. All right, well, what about when I stand my hair on end? How do I stand my hair on end? Well, I've got a muscle called an erector pili muscle. And the erector pili is going to contract to stand my hair on end. All right, so that is the structure of a hair follicle. That's why it's important. Vellus hair. This is the fine, light hair covering the bodies of children and adult females. Terminal hair is what we find on the head, so your eyebrows, your hair. And then they say you find terminal hair on the bodies of adult males. Although I would argue that my Sasquatch legs after about a week have terminal hair as well. So I don't know what that's about. Terminal hair is the hair on your head and the bodies of adult males. And the face of adult males. But that's part of their body, right? It is. OK, vellus hair, uh, terminal hair, and then lanugo. Lanugo is really pale hair. It's blonde. And it can actually be pretty thick. This is, it covers um, babies in utero. So this is the thick, um, light hair that covers fetuses. So if a baby's born super early, they might actually still have some lanugo on their body and on their faces. If you've ever seen a baby with like a blonde face, it's probably that it was born early and it still has some of its lanugo. Okay. All right. Physiological functions of hair include A, providing sensory information, B, protection from heat loss, C, attracting potential partners, D, all of the above, E, A and B only. Now that photo is not me, but it could have been me. I looked like this. Can you even see it? You're blocking my epic picture here, Kelly. Look at that. This was the hair in the 90s. The higher you could get those bangs, the better. So OK, the answer is A and B only. And I changed the wording of this question, because the last time I had a face-to-face -face class, I had somebody like argue all of the above for attracting potential partners. And they were like, yeah, if you like bangs that high, that's going to attract your potential partner. That's a function. OK. But that's more like a psychological function. 
I would say, than a physiological function. That's why I changed it. Physiological functions of the hair. Like, what's it actually doing so that you can survive? Okay, but then you could say, well, if you don't have hot, awesome hair that's standing up a mile high, and you can't attract a partner, and you can't reproduce, that's fine. You can still live. Your survival is independent on you attracting a partner. So I would say that's too far away to be a physiological, straightforward function of your hair. Okay, all right, nails. Again, nails, we're not gonna go over the structure in great detail. The function of nails is protection. Um, it protects the distal ends of your phalanges, and it also can help like the same thing, cat fight. <laughs> you could scratch your cat's eyes out. No, it's like an actual cat fight that's more important where they have super sharp nails. But in like a teenage cat fight, <laughs> They might scratch each other's faces too, I don't know. Functions, protection. Protecting two things, the distal ends of the phalanges and they can be used for defense. So protection for the distal ends of phalanges and in defense. So the last thing we need to talk about here um, are the exocrine glands of the skin. Exocrine glands, if you recall from epithelial tissues, are the glands that release their product into a duct that empties onto an epithelial surface. So our skin is a huge epithelial surface, stratified squamous epithelial tissue, and we've got all these glands that dump onto it. So sudoriferous glands are sweat glands. And, you know, I have all of these silly ways to help you remember things. And back in the day, when I was coming up with one for this one, I was like, oh, sweat, sudoriferous. Sweat is odoriferous. Sudoriferous rhymes with odoriferous. You can remember that sudoriferous glands are sweat glands because sweat is odoriferous. And my daughter Lydia hated that one. It was her least favorite. She was like, odoriferous isn't even a word. Mwah! Well, yeah, and not all sweat is stinky, so you got that one too. But eccrine sweat is the first type of pseudoreverous gland we're going to talk about. Um, eccrine sweat glands you find over your entire integument. These are the sweat glands that are responsible for body temperature regulation. So you've got these over your entire integument. You've got a high proportion of them in thick skin, so in the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. These release a waste-rich, waste salty sweat that's important for body temperature regulation. So their name by name is eccrine gland. Their, their type by method of secretion is merocrine. Does anybody remember what merocrine secretion is? It's when our secretory cells release their product by exocytosis, right? Right. So, okay, that's our first type of sweat gland and it's odorless. Okay, this is also what's helping to give us the acid mantle of the skin. Now our next type of sweat gland is called an apocrine sweat gland. And this is confusing because there's a new growing body of evidence which suggests that apocrine sweat glands are merocrine by method of release. But they used to say they were apocrine by method of release. What's apocrine method of release? It's when you accumulate your product on top of your, on the apical surface of the cell and then butt off, right? Right. So, I don't know. I don't know. Apocrine sweat glands are found in two locations. We have these in high number in the axillary and pubic regions. And these also secrete an odorless sweat, but it's rich in protein. And the bacteria on your skin loves to eat that protein and then bacteria fart, so that's what stinks. So we could say that they release an odorless, protein-rich sweat. And this is important in chemical signaling. So and in communication. What? Brain break. 
it's actually a relevant example and it's pretty darn important. So you've probably heard of pheromones and you know like oh Ooh, pheromones, like, oh, I was like, I liked his pheromones or whatever. Or maybe you've heard of, may, maybe you haven't heard of that, but maybe you have heard of the fact that females will sync their menstrual cycles. So when people started observing that, scientists, of course, want to know why. Why does all of this happen? Is it happening because of some kind of chemical signaling that's happening? Is it happening because people who live in the same house are like have the same environmental conditions, they wake up at the same time, they eat the same foods, what? So is there actual pheromonal signaling that's happening from person to person? Um, and so that's, that's what we call it, is pheromonal signaling when our signaling is from one individual to another individual. So this is like, but it's in the same species. So this is how we can say we can communicate between uh, different members of the same species. Okay, so how do we test this for dormitory syndrome? What they were noticing is that all of these females living in the same dorms were syncing up their menstrual cycles. Okay, so I wonder how they noticed that. <laughs> if there was like a high proportion of females ditching class at the same time or something, I don't know. They started making the observation though, so they started testing it. And what did they do? Well, you know, when you're in college, you're hungry. So you're like, I could use 50 bucks to buy your supply of ramen noodles, great. So you're down in the student union and you see like an advertisement, get paid $50 to be in this scientific experiment. So they put some of those up at CU Boulder and they put some down at CU Denver because these females are far enough apart that if these females are all singing together, and not syncing with these ones, and these ones are all syncing together and not syncing with these ones, then it could, you know, it's probably just because their environmental conditions are the same. Well, if there's pheromonal signaling that we can take advantage of somehow and test, then we can maybe get these ones to sync with these ones. So how do you do this experiment? In CU Boulder, you get your 500 women. They sign up and they come down and what they have to do is wear an armpit pad. Every day, they just stick a pad when, before class, they stick a pad in their armpit and they just go about their day. At the end of the day, they collect it and they turn it in. All right, 50 bucks, great. I can eat all the ramen I want. All right, this, the, the chicks down at CU Denver, they sign up, they get their 50 bucks, they're all excited. And what they have to do is they just go in every day and they're like, and then they leave. So yeah, that's what's happening, is they're going in every day and they're smelling this armpit pad <laughs> from the girls, from the women and CU Boulder. And they have no idea, but sure enough, they were able to sync all of the females in CU Denver to the females in CU Boulder. I don't know, this is probably not where they did the experiment, by the way. This is my, like, what is that called? My, you know, my little asterisk. Like, you cannot sue me because I got the universities wrong. The point is that you can sync females from across miles just by sniffing the pheromones coming out of apocrine sweat glands. Okay, the other thing is that they say that dogs and bees smell fear. They are smelling that fear in your apocrine sweat. That is called allelomonal signaling. So allelomones are a way that these are signals to different members of an opposite species. So we'll say signals to another species. And so the cool thing about that is now that you know it, now you don't ever have to be afraid of a bee again because as soon as they smell your fear, they get afraid and they're going to sting you. So my daughter also, my little brother, taught her to pet bees when she was like three years old. So, and then I told her, okay, well, just don't ever be afraid and then it'll be all right. So she became so good at petting bees. Like it got to the point where like I'd be sitting out studying on the patio and she'd come up to me, mom, she'd open her hands and like six bees would come pouring out. And it was just like her lack of fear was just like making it so it was okay. And then like I, the, the, it got bad, I think the max was eight. When she got eight bees in her little tiny like four-year-old hands, they all stung her. And that was the end of that. Uh, so just, I mean, but that's the other thing. Like I'm telling my son now, like don't be afraid. So to the point where I've had wasps land on my face and I just close my eye and I breathe and they crawl across my face. Because if you don't get afraid, then you're not releasing all these chemical signals and these proteins and they're not getting afraid and then they won't sting you. Try that next time you see a bee, but don't sue me if it doesn't work out well. Okay, 
So sebaceous glands, we already addressed a little bit when we talked about the hair follicle. These release sebum that makes the hair soft and pliable. What is sebum? Sebum is an oily substance. And again, it makes your hair soft and pliable. I'm not going to write that down again. The sebaceous glands become super active in males whose faces are beginning to grow all that terminal hair. So uh, parts, uh, sebum itself is um, antimicrobial, but how is, how, sebum is released through holocrine secretion. Do you remember how holocrine secretion goes? That's when our secretory cell accumulates a product and then the whole cell disintegrates. So some of those cell fragments can be tasty. So if you get a bacteria that hops onto that hair and climbs down into that hair follicle, oh, and there's some cell fragments in there and it eats it up, oh, it's gonna, and then it's gonna start replicating by fission. So you get all this bacteria in there. There's a blood vessel there, so we can get white blood cells there. Neutrophils go there. They start gobbling it up and then you get a whole bunch of pus in there and then you get a huge white head on your face. And it poof, ruptures, it's disgusting. And poor teenage males with super active sebaceous glands have to deal with that while their voice is changing and their brains are changing and their pairs are changing and it's just probably awful. I'm glad I was never a teenage male. Sorry, teenage males. Okay, so <laughs> this oily substance that makes the hair soft and pliable and the glands are holocrine by method of release. Okay. And again, that means that they accumulate their product and then the whole cell disintegrates. Other apocrine glands, why do I say apocrine glands? Other apocrine glands. Because back here, at these apocrine glands, are they apocrine or merocrine? I don't know, we call them apocrine. They might be merocrine. We definitely have some other apocrine glands and now I'm talking about method of release. So apocrine by method of release. <clears throat> meaning that your secretory cell accumulates its product and then pinches off a bud into the duct. Cerumenous glands in your ears secrete a waxy substance called cerumen. So these secrete out oh, cerumen. And this is a waxy substance. It's bitter. What is the point? Well, if a bug crawls into your ear, the wax is going to stick to its feet and that's not going to feel good. And then this bitter taste is going to taste bad, so they're going to get out of there. So this is sticky and it's bitter and so it's protective. How do I know it's bitter? Did I read it in my book? I don't know if I read it in my book, but I know when I was a kid I was tasting everything that came out of my body and I tasted earwax and it sure is bitter. Okay. <laughs> All right, man, I am like liberal with the fun facts today. It's because skin is so boring on its own. Okay, your other glands by, apocrine glands by method of release are mammary glands. These are found in mammary tissue and <clears throat> these are going to produce and release milk. Again, the secretory cell will accumulate milk on the apical portion, pinch off a bud that drops into the lactiferous duct that then is going to eject onto the surface of the nipple. All right, so those are our exocrine glands. I have a quick question for you. What is the name of the glands that produce earwax? A, apocrine gland, B, ceruminous gland, C, eccrine gland, D, all of the above. Ooh, the answer is B, ceruminous gland. And you might say, yeah, but you said it was an apocrine gland. It sure was by method of release. This question is asking, what is the name? And the answer is ceruminous. All right, that wraps up the integument. I'll see you soon in the discussion page. If your teacher farts during class and his cheeks turn red, the effect is due <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cut. <sighs> Cut. Two types of hair that we find after you're born. In utero, you have uh, your whole entire body is covered in this stuff called lanugo. Helps you keep your body temperature. Why is it, I don't know, why is the mom's body temperature not enough? Why do babies have lanugo? Maybe because if they're born too early, then their little fur still is all over them and then they're more warm? I don't know, these are all good questions. Vellus hair is the kind of light, like peach fuzz, that you find 
on the scalps of babies and all over the bodies of female adults. Well, all over everywhere on babies and kids. And then terminal hair is what we find like on your head hair. And then terminal hair, they also say allegedly is only on male faces and bodies. Although, like, if I go long enough without shaving, these Sasquatch legs would challenge that. I would say that females can grow terminal hair on their legs. I don't know.